All right, folks, you know what that hard rock and Madison Rising music means. It means it's time for another episode of Student of the Gun Radio. And welcome to the new week. Welcome to another week of Student of the Gun. And we're going to help you get through it, Jared and I. We're going to work with you. We're going to help you get through this week each and every day right up till Friday. And we've got a lot to talk about this week. And I've got a special guest for you. He's waiting out on the line. And this is a kind of an interesting situation uh, for me. I saw this video clip, and probably, I don't know, five, six, seven, ten of you folks out there in the audience sent us notes and messages and so forth and said, hey, did you see this? Take a look at this. This, this is what's going on, yada, yada, yada. And the uh, I, I get the news story. I see the news story, and the title of it is Guns Make No Difference. Pro-gun group reenacts Charles Hebdo. I don't know how you pronounce that. I'm not a frog. But uh, Charles Hebdo. Uh, and so the, the, the bold headline is Guns Make No Difference. I'm like, what the hell? So I watched the short video. And, of course, the video that I see is the the local Dallas news station or Fort Worth or whatever it was. The, the And the little reporter at Chick, you know, they, they – do a voiceover, they show a bunch of video, and then at the very end, she comes on and she summarizes what you just saw. And she summarizes and she said, all but all but one victim, in all the scenarios, all but one survived and or was killed. And the only one that survived was the one that chose to run away. And, you know, guns make no difference. So obviously I'm, I'm duct taping my head, I'm smacking my, my forehead against the wall because here we go again. Uh, and we know that after the... You guys are smart. You know that after the the Virginia Tech deal, that CNN set up this hoax, uh, you know, thing where they they took a bunch of volunteer college students and gave them Sims guns and said, "Okay, here, go play." And they said, "See, see, it wouldn't make any difference. All of you pro gun people who think that you should be allowed to have guns, you're all crazy and out of touch, and and only a well armed state can uh, you know solve your problems." Well, th- that's what I saw, and that's what I do. So. That's what I had to go on. Well, I did. What I didn't realize that is that one of the guys behind the masks, one of the ones that you couldn't see their face, was my friend Sonny Pazikas, and I've got him on the line right now. Sonny and I talked off air uh, previously, and he said, "Yeah, there there were a lot of lessons to be learned that you didn't get from the two minute video," and so I said, "All right, let's go ahead and hash it out. I'll bring you on Student of the Gun Radio." And uh, we're going to talk about it. So without further ado, Sonny Pazikas. Hey, Sonny. Hello, Paul. Thanks for joining us. Hello, Paul. Hello, student of the gun. Uh, well, without any further ado, I guess let me address the, the, the headline as it stood, that guns make no difference. Uh, yeah, gun by itself placed in the vicinity of the event uh, without a person willing and to some degree capable to use it would make no difference. Uh, that is a fact. Uh, so besides that. A gun's not just a magic talisman that like the presence of a gun in a building doesn't provide a cone of protection around everyone. No, and I, you know, I think for the training community and, and, and the, the, you know, population, the segment of population that do choose to own and carry weapons, that's also a important factor to realize that just by the virtue of you having the gun doesn't necessarily significantly increases your chances of you know prevailing, surviving, whatever. Uh, there needs to be training. There needs to be some knowledge and skill how to use it, and and that that did make a lot of difference. That was not reported by news. Now, before we get it a little bit farther, some people, I know you're, you're going to say, like, how could they not? But some people in the audience, they're hearing your voice right now, and they're thinking, this is the first time I've ever heard of this Sonny Pazikas character, and he doesn't sound like he's from New Jersey. Could could you give the audience a quick uh, background about who Sonny Pazikas is and how he got to Texas? <laughs> yeah. Well, I wasn't born in Texas, but I got here as soon as I could. Uh I was born in the former Soviet Union in Lithuania, um, immigrated to U.S. in the mid-90s uh, after my military service in the evil empire. And uh, as you know, since then, since we we met in the personal protection business, 
Uh, I've been doing for quite a few years protection work and uh, for the last 15 or so years been involved with training. Yeah, Sonny and I actually met on a, a bodyguard contract in 19, was it 99, Sonny? 98 or 99? 90, 99. Yeah. So yeah, it's been that long since uh, that we've been acquainted. And let me tell you what, folks. If it's anybody who knows the mind of the modern goat rapist, uh, it's Sonny Pazikas. He knows what they're all about. He knows what they're capable of, and he knows how to defeat them. Unfortunately, people aren't always receptive to that because it might hurt someone's feelings. Yeah, well, you know, feelings are like uh, like certain parts of anatomy. Everyone has them, and, uh, and, and it's okay. And I'm getting too old to worry about hurting someone's feelings. You <laughs> can't be loved by everyone, and that's just the nature of, nature of this life. <laughs> Well, all right. Tell us about this, uh, the the uh, Patriot Protection scenario, and some of the the actually what the results that you found that weren't recorded and weren't reported. Okay. Well, first, first of all, let me just go a little bit in detail about what what was the setup. Okay. Uh, the whole thing happened basically within twenty four hours. Uh, Patriot Protection, you know, the only the only role that Patriot Protection served was facilitating the the so called study uh the the idea of study came from uh the group i believe they are from austin called the truth about guns and they basically contacted patriot protection saying that uh they wanted to reenact as close as possible the scenario that played out at uh, charlie hebdo offices in paris and uh they wanted to invite just a regular uh concealed carry folks basically from the street and uh, have some actors to play you know other people in the office and have a couple of uh, instructors affiliated with with patriot protection or whatever to play bad guys okay so the setup was you know when people say you know that that all the shooters were without glue uh, uh you know to me to me it's funny there's there's we, we always mock anti-gun community you know, for their for their bias, for their uh, you know, close mindedness and 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 short side how so short sighted they are. Yet yet you know, in comments after the whole thing kind of blew up, you know, you hear all these people, you know, gun owners, <laughs> supposedly adults, you know, screaming how much better they would have done because you know they are not just gun owners because they 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 would have just wasted and smoked the terrorists and and so forth. These were your average CCW people. Uh, some had some force on force training. Some only went to NRA mandated training, whatever is required mm -hmm. to get the permit. The minimum eight and hours. And like yeah. it, dislike it. The truth is that majority of people are of that caliber. Okay, there's very very few, quote unquote, and I hate the word, you know, operators and uh, you know with tactical beards and everything else running around that, that could, uh, you know, defeat the whole team of Taliban all by themselves. Well, we, we, the we, point we... is it, it was, it was regular, regular folks, mm -hmm. you know, some, some with some training, none of them were, you know, quote unquote, high speed trained people, but just mocking them and saying, you know, that they were clueless. They didn't know what they're doing. They were representative of majority of, CCW crowd. Yeah, we've talked about that previously. We, we hammer on that, and I actually have gotten pushback. You know, oh, you, you, you firearms instructors, you're just trying to, to like, you know, get people's money and convince them that they need training. I, I've been shooting since I was 12 years old. I don't, you know, I don't need any of that training. So, uh, I know what I'm doing. So they've been ingraining <laughs> bad habits in themselves since they were 12 years old. And and but you know when we do our like we we do a class that's called armed living and it meets Mississippi's uh, enhanced concealed carry standards and something that I've been doing for well, just years and years I'm like look when you come to your first class your that isn't the end of your training that's the beginning you should, and, and unfortunately a lot of people feel like well all right I, I did my eight hour my mandatory eight hour state class where they spent four hours telling me how I was going to go to prison if I did something wrong, and that's the end of my training. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, that's pretty pretty sad state of affairs if that's how it is. You know, it shouldn't be that way. 
Uh, as far as accusations that, you know, you instructors all you care about is taking people's money, uh, you know what? Here's the thing. Is there a, a you know business you know <laughs> dimension to 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 trading industry? Of course, of course, there's been a dimension. Uh, but uh, I submit to you, even people that you know, I personally have huge disagreements about trading methodologies, or 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 even more than that. Most of them are actually fairly passionate or very passionate about teaching people and you know, making people better at what they do. So to say that uh, this is nothing but business, it's, uh, I'm, I'm sorry to say, but it's uh, bull****. It's, it's an empty accusation that has zero, zero merit. And I don't know what else to add. <laughs> I don't know what else to add. All right, well, well, tell us some of what you saw uh, as far as how people reacted. Okay, so basically what we had, we had uh, in each scenario there were 10 or 11 unarmed actors spaced throughout, I believe we had six or seven rooms uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the building, uh, force and force facility, and uh, we didn't know which one out of 11 or 12 that were in that building would be armed. We were not told which one will have a weapon. Uh, as a matter of fact, in our first run, we were told that there will be no armed person, and this is just to demonstrate how quickly things would end, and and that's that. Well, whether it was a technical glitch, mistake, or miscommunication, there was an armed person in our first run, and one of us got shot almost immediately once, once we entered the room, and uh, so... <laughs> You know, to to address one thing where, where people say, well, the, the test wasn't set up perfectly. Uh, to set up such a test perfectly, Paul, it would require uh, <laughs> incredible resources. For one, oh, you yeah. have to realize that uh, shooting, you know, some munitions or UTM rounds or whatever, uh, most of the actors and uh, the CCW person with the weapon in there, they wore full head protection. Mm -hmm. Some of them had chest protection and so forth. Uh, Often you don't feel the shots unless it hits you somewhere where it truly really hurts. <laughs> like uh, you don't feel the shots. So to pick the timing, who shot whom first, even if you had precision cameras on each individual following them throughout the movement, throughout everything, it would have incredible amount of work to take an incredible amount of work to figure out exactly the timing where the person was hit. Would he be able to operate after being hit here and still shoot back? So, you know, accuracy of such tests, is, is, it can be debated to till the cows come home. Yeah, and that that was one thing that I always, that I was telling people afterwards, I was like, you can't really reenact a terrorist attack. To get the re results that you really want, you'd actually have to do a terrorist attack. Well, and, yeah, and, and, and also, and, you know, it's the whole, you know, do, you know even if it's, a, if it's a pistol, it's a rifle, what have you, uh, People don't vaporize and burst into flames the moment a bullet touches their skin. Uh, you know, the whole flying backwards through the plate glass windows and stuff. And everyone's been conditioned to believe that, you know, the moment a round touches you, you're, you're, you've been, you know, vaporized. Or you're, and that's not the fact. You know, people, I, I don't know about, I'm, well, I'm sure you have. I've, in my experience, have been injured during a scenario or during a situation. Um, and I didn't realize I was injured until everything calmed down and the adrenaline dropped. And I looked and I'm like, oh, crap, I'm bleeding. I should probably put a bandage on that. Uh, and I, I actually gashed my arm really bad when I was in the Marine Corps doing something. Uh, and I didn't realize it until the adrenaline dropped. And I'm looking there and there's blood dripping off my arm. I said, Phew. I, didn't, I don't even know how that happened. I legitimately have no idea how I got injured, but I was, and I didn't realize it until afterwards. So, you know, that's something that also we tell people, like, after, if you ever are involved in a, in a lethal force encounter, take a, several deep breaths and check yourself to see if you're hurt or bleeding. And be like, oh, I'll know if I'm bleeding. That's just silly. I, I, of course I'll know. You, so you <laughs> might not. Yeah, well, you know, it, it, it's like this. I, I think both sides, anti-gun and pro-gun sides, for one, I think we need to, to calibrate our expectations, what we expect from uh, quote, quote, such you know, studies or tests. Mm -hmm. 
uh, anti-gun media, whatever. No matter what happens, no matter what we do, we're not going to change their tune. We're not going to change their opinion, and we're not going to change their bias. Okay? What we should stop doing is trying to change them. Okay, there is there is there is a segment of population that isn't decided, so to speak, on the fence about the whole gun issue, about the, the constitutional carry, and so forth and so forth. Okay, these are the people that need to hear a adult argument from us, from gun owners, from pro Second Amendment people, not this childish of this is bull. You know, uh, if I was there, I would have smoked both the bad guys, and it would have been different outcome. You know, we had a from from from. People that participated actively in the in the in the study, you know, one of the shooters was former Marine. There's there were a couple people that attended quite a few courses in force and force, and uh, quite a few people that were actually fairly good shots. Uh, if I remember correctly, one person was a competitive shooter. So you know, all this noise about that, oh, they were just uh, you know, zero training douchebags from the street. Uh, you know, stop acting like a child. These these were your representatives of you know average, uncaring person in this country. Well, they were not the worst. They were not the best. They were okay. average. And if when you when it, when you break it down, you know, you look at a scenario like this and you say, okay, now am I correct in believing that they during the scenario that they just had one weapon and then they they passed it around throughout different people. They they mixed it up. Yes. Okay. So let's say, you know, and, and a lot of folks, like, for instance, you, you remember the, uh, just recently, the Las Vegas uh, police, uh, the murder of the two police officers, and then the, uh, yes. and then they, they walked into the Walmart and the concealed carry guy, he failed. Yes. Well, he failed, but he didn't fail. And we talked about this in detail on the show. That guy engaged the bad people, and he was shot by a secondary bad person, right? Now, my question yes. to this is, and this really hacked me off, is they interview the guy's buddy who was there with him, who who said, hey, my buddy, we, he saw this and he says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop this or whatever. And I wanted to say to that guy's buddy, where was your gun, douche? How come your buddy was the only one carrying a gun? How come he had to be the designated gun carrier? Where were you? And if there were two or three armed good guys... Numbers always matter. And, and, you know, the, the, the old axiom of, you know, bring a gun, bring friends with guns. Uh, if you have to go to a gunfight, do cops go to gunfights by themselves? No. They bring friends with guns all the time as a matter of course. And so, you know, and as far as the, the guy in the, the Walmart, the fact is, is even though he died, he forced those two douchebags, those two scumbags, he forced their attention upon him. And let's say that they only had to deal with him for 30 or 45 seconds, maybe a minute. So they deal with him for a minute. How many people escaped from that building in one minute while they were dealing really with far him? far in a minute. Yeah, I mean, if I said, go, start running, how far could you get away in a minute? Could you be out of Walmart in, you know, in the parking lot at your car in one minute if you ran? Probably. So, you know, that guy, he died, and I'm sorry that he died, but he died sacrificing his life so other people could get out and live. And you know what? You, If you choose to fight, you might die. But if you lay down on the ground under the table and put your hands on your head, you absolutely 100% will die. Oh, thoughts? <laughs> It's, you know, I, I'm 100% with you when, when, when uh, and I'm going to use maybe stronger language than I should, but uh, when stupid folks say that uh, something like that makes no difference, yes, it absolutely makes difference. It actually makes very, very significant difference. And, uh, you know, back to, to our test, after, after our first one where the gun owner was a surprise for us, we didn't know there was supposed to be someone with a gun, and one of us got shot almost immediately, and then, you know, one, the other one engaged and took out the gun owner and then engaged other people and so forth. Uh, when we went in for the second time, knowing that there is a chance that there's someone there with a gun, for one, it significantly slowed us down. We actually started using some kind of a skill uh, tactics upon, upon, <laughs> upon entering the rooms upon clearing the corners and and, and, and and kicking in the doors and so forth okay uh, that by itself giving time 
is a significant difference. Like you said, even if you're able to provide, you know, through, through self-sacrifice, if you didn't succeed in, in, you know, successfully engaging both bad guys, if you're able to provide your coworkers, your friends, your family, whatever, 15, 20, 30, 40 seconds, I'm sorry, you know, people can jump out the windows, people can, can start doing all kinds of things. Later on, we talk to students, I'm like, you know, first shots, shots ring out, there is a shootout between one good guy and two bad guys. Others can do all kinds of things in your offices. You have paper, light that on fire, let the, let the fire alarms go off. You know, do you think that's not going to be a distraction to the bad guys? Do you think that's not going to add the time to what they, you know, yeah. attempting to do? Of course it will. It makes very, very significant difference. Again, my comrade or me, when we were shot on a few occasions, we were shot with UTM rounds. Okay, I, I, I don't know, if, you know, no matter how determined the attackers are, but when we see your buddy's uh, brains leaking out, it may actually have effect on your determination. Yeah, it's like if sure. It doesn't, that, you know. If it doesn't have an <laughs> impact upon your determination it's probably going to have impact upon your sound judgment on what you're going to do next. Yeah, people say, well, what am I supposed to do? It's just me and there's two or three guys. Shoot the first one and see if the second ones want to keep coming. And yes. most vermin, not all, but most street vermin, if you shoot the alpha, they'll scatter. Not always, but a lot of them times they will. My question to Sonny is, and you might be able to answer it too, but... My question is um, the the ratio of terrorists that actually go in and they do um, they do insur insurgent attacks like this one where they walk into a building are they usually more trained than your uh, typical goat rapist or are they just you know I mean the uh, from, from from little that I've seen on the video of those two guys in Paris I would say that <laughs> they were definitely not newbies. Mm. Okay, they were definitely not newbies. Would they call, would I call them, you know, tier one level guys? Absolutely not. You know, but you don't have to be tier one when you have two rifles. Right. Yeah. And you, you know, know the whole walking around. So all screaming. this, you know, how 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 well trained they are? Are they operator level? Are they civilian level? You know, it, it, it's it's relative. Again, from what I saw, based on how those two guys worked, I, I would definitely say they were above average. Right. So they they got. But then some again, training. we always saw small outtakes. So and it's hard to say how they operated inside the building, what were their tactics and around in the corner. And I'm assuming they went in pretty bravely, knowing that oh, there yeah. were no weapons. Oh yeah, it's 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 a turkey shoot. They they go in all they're emboldened. They're like, we're going to make yep. these infidels pay, and it's it's yep. go time. And they're screaming Aloha snack bar, you know, every two steps. Uh, yep. And uh, praise Allah, and you know, pop, 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 and all that jazz. Uh, it's almost like they can't help themselves. And you know, I'm gonna if I can give the listening audience a little tidbit. If you're in your office building and you hear someone out in the front lobby screaming "Aloha, snack bar," grab something to kill with. That's all I'm going to tell you. Um, just get get ready to get some killing on. My, it's it's going to have to happen. My point with the question was. To, to the listening audience, if you can hear my voice, my question to you is, are you going to be more prepared than the people that are invading the building or the terrorists that come to you or your attacker? Are you going to be more prepared than them or less prepared? Well, yeah. <laughs> you know, me personally, I, I, I think it's actually a direct individual question and almost encouragement to each listener. You know, are you going to be happy with what you have now after you took that eight-hour course for concealed carry? Or are you actually going to go seek out training, get better, test yourself in situations like that? Once you work through certain things, are you going to get some scenario training to, to experience the, the, the feeling, to experience the rush, to experience the emotions that come with it? Or are you just going to be happy carrying your, you know, uh, <laughs> Smith & Wesson in, in, in the small of your back? Uh, I'm pretty that, good. That, I know what, that, I know what that, I'm doing. And, and I know how to shoot a gun. I don't need your training. I, I truly believe that the the quickest way to change or influence the anti-gun crowd is to get training and be better and stop making mistakes as gun carriers, and that will show them that we're actually responsible. Well, the, let's, let's break down the anti-gun crowd real quick. 
here's here's what I'm not concerned about. I'm not concerned about getting Brian Williams and Katie Couric and all those no, left wing defense people. sitters. No, yeah, and that's what I'm talking about. Is and this is the this is the danger of stories like this, and, and it doesn't. Because as far as I'm concerned personally, it doesn't affect me. I'm carrying. I got two guns on my body right now. Uh, I'm sure Jared's got at least one, if not two, on his body. That's not going to change us. But what I'm thinking is, you've got every time we hold a class, every time Jaeger holds a class, every time they have, you know, you have these mid 40s, mid 50s husbands and wives, and they come to the class and they say, you know, we never have been gun people, but we just decided that. You know, time is right. We need to get, we need to buy guns. We need to get some training and so forth. And there's tens of thousands of those people out there. And they're, they're, what I don't want is I don't want the person who is, cons- you know, talking to their wife, talking to their husband, let's, let's go to this gun store, let's buy a gun, let's get some training. Then they watch this and they say, well, these are professionals and they conducted this and it says, you know, it, it wouldn't even matter. It's kind of like talking people out of getting medical training. Oh, you just you just sit back and you wait for the professionals to arrive. I'm like, well, that doesn't do any good if somebody you love is bleeding to death at your feet, and you say, well, I'll just wait for the professionals to arrive because I you know I don't need to take care of that myself. I don't like situations or stories that talk good people out of doing what they should do. And sadly, in America, we've had such a comfortable existence that most people aren't even raised thinking, I need to train, I need to learn, I need to get more education, uh, where you know your, your fathers and grandfathers maybe took that for granted. Today, we're so comfortable that you, it's almost like you have to convince people to save their own lives. You know, Paul, it's... it's uh Here's, I think, one of the fallacies is that, that, that somehow if we do things differently in training and demonstrations and reenactments, whatever, somehow we're going to affect the media. Somehow the media is going to see the truth, see the light, and go like, you know what? Guns in uh, well-trained individuals' hands can actually change the outcomes of situations like that. Media will never say that. Media will never say that. There's, no, there's no, nothing... That's not part of their agenda. That. They have an agenda. They have an agenda. They're paid by people. They belong to people that have an agenda. The people that finance the agenda, the Bloombergs of the world, the, you know, the, the moms against whatever, you know, all, 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 all those, you know, zero common sense people. But, you know, as far as the, and I hate to use the word, but, but unfortunately it's true, the consumer, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. They look at that and, and, and they look at that and if, if, if the person does not have enough common sense to look at this and see through that it's nothing more than media bias, that it's an agenda, okay, and takes it for what it is, we can't help that person either. Yeah. Well, you know... We can't help that person either, you know. We <laughs> cannot create some kind of a demonstration scenario that media will put a positive spin from the pro-Second Amendment standpoint and, and, and present it to the public. It's, it's simply not going to happen. Well, I guess what we're doing right now is recreating, we're creating little disciples, little people with that have information that can actually say to their coworker Phil or their neighbor Susie or whatever. Because the people that listen to this show, they're the the gun kind of people, and they have friends that when they get that little nervousness, they'll go to them and they're like, "Hey, you, you're a gun person, right? You you own guns." What do you think about this? And that's where they have the opportunity to make a positive difference, to make a positive change. Say, hey, okay, this may be your first time or you may be a beginner. That's cool. You're a beginner once, but you should be a student for life. Let's go ahead and start and get them rolling. And you know what? We've been talking yak and yak and we're using kind of industry lingity. I think probably many people in the audience aren't cops or SF or whatever. Um, Sims and, and FX cartridges, UTM cartridges. Here's what they are, folks. They basically are a paint for other for it's you know, detergent based, whatever. It's a marker. Uh, it's not a paintball. A lot of people are like, oh, it's a paintball, right? No, it's not a paintball. It's a cartridge of ammunition, but instead of shooting a lead projectile, or it shoots a paint marker for. And the guns that you use, and the way the reason that it is a, a valuable training experience is because. The firearms 
function and feel like legitimate firearms, like real guns, but and they cycle like real guns and everything's the same, except that they shoot a paint marker and they go pop and they expend a piece of brass and you have to pick them all up from the school before uh, you can finish your training that day. <laughs> um, so, but yeah, that's that's what that's all about. For those of you that you're like, what's this all about? It says in the story, it says they shoot paintball guns. I'm like, no, it's, it's not a paintball gun. It's an actual designated trainer. And they're not cheap either, are they, Sonny? No, they're not cheap. You, you're you looking at about a dollar per round, including the training. And, uh, you know, another another interesting fact about it is that depending on the manufacturer and the type you use, whether it's UTM or submission, they travel anywhere between 350 to 650 feet per second. Uh, so if you don't have proper protection, you can get injured. Uh, both me and my partner that played bad guys, we had eye protection, but uh, we didn't use full face protection, and both of us got shot in the face a couple of times. And uh, I still have scars, and this is three weeks later. So uh, it is, it is, uh, it is a valuable training tool because it does give you, you know, at least initially, it gives you a little bit of fear of being hit. Oh yeah, because that's a little, that bit, stuff hurts. a little bit more cautious about it. It hurts, and. Uh, that's one of the reasons why in my training I, I prefer guys not to use body protection, only only head protection. That way people actually respect it and it doesn't became, become training like that has a danger of becoming a little bit too gamey. Yeah, well, like when when you when a a team when you have a poli- a SWAT team and they enter and the the they're all gear they're all jocked up with gloves and pads and helmets and everything and you're peppering them and they're just coming through like the Terminator and you're like it's like the yeah. Terminator man I just emptied a whole magazine and he's not stopping. <laughs> well, the mm-hmm. Sims training and force on force that is the closest you're going to get to a gunfight without actually being in a gunfight. Oh, and speaking of yes. force on at force, this, at, this, at this point, at this point, it is. At this point, there really there, there isn't any you know better alternatives to 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 actually experience the you know the factors that that are present in the gunfights. Obviously, there is one very very huge factor missing, which is fear of death. Yeah. But that that unfortunately cannot truly be duplicated in any kind of training. Yeah. If, you, if you want that fear, go jump out of an airplane. <laughs> yeah, that or you know, travel to Syria. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, speaking of which, brother, what do you think about uh, King Abdullah uh, pulling out all the stops over there? Good for him, you know. It's 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 you know it's it's. I know there's a lot of chatter, you know, warrior king and all that. Look, I mean, he's a soldier. He's you know, it's 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 to me, it's it's, it's all good. It's nice that he's pulling the stops. It's, they 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 doing it. Truly, what bothers me is that, for the most part, the world was silent, you know, when, uh, I don't know, oh, yeah. 50, 100,000 died. But it took something on TV, something gruesome, something, you know, something that we perceive as, oh, this is barbaric. Guys, this is this is war, you know, beheading person, burning person, and all that. Think about it, you know. That's one of the reasons when I was in the military, you know, we were always kind of joking about it. We go like, I prefer to be door kicker versus the pilot because pilot is always the most hated by the enemy. If they capture you, because how they look at you, you're dropping bombs, mm-hmm. you're burning people from the distance. They see those people, you know, that, that whether they're combatants, terrorists, or just freaking civilians, you know, they see people burning from the, fucking, you know, bombs being dropped and, and, and all that stuff. So, <laughs> you know, we, we just been so, so insulated from true horrors of what people in the world see it every day. That once we see it, we we'll go like it's a call for action. You know, call for action was a long time ago. Yeah, it's it's kind of <laughs> pathetic that that we're we're allowing the Jordanians. It's like I, I don't want to get into politics on this because we're actually thirty four minutes into it. But uh, yeah. <laughs> Well, I, I w- actually want to. We got to do a good guy of the week, and then we're going to cut out the show. But Sonny, I wanted to thank you for taking the time out of your day uh, to talk with us, and uh, we really appreciate it. Uh, and it gives, I, you know, what we wanted to give some perspective to this. And, and folks, if you get not, this is, I guess the the takeaway that you really should get from that whole entire situation was if you're going to carry a gun. You need to have more than just a gun on you. You need to have some skill in your body. You need to have some confidence in your skill. And if you're the only one in your crowd that's carrying a gun, get a new crowd. Get a new crowd. 
Why do you have to be the designated driver all the time? Why do you have to be the designated shooter? Let somebody else carry the load for a while. I mean, I carry two guns, and, and, and obviously there's lots of tactical reasons to have two guns. But the, the fact is, is people are like, well, are you paranoid or crazy or something? How many people are you planning to shoot? Well, I'm not planning to shoot any because I'd have a rifle instead of a you know pistol. But could you pass off your second gun to a, a person that you know is trained and capable, and now you have two gun two, two shooters instead of one? I'd rather, you know, bring friends with guns. Bring guns, bring friends with guns. And uh, everybody gets needs to get some training. And wherever you do it, I don't care. If you do it in Texas, you do it in Missouri, you do it in Tennessee, do it in Biloxi, Mississippi. And if you really want to sweat and you want to get down and dirty, you come down to the House of Pain and you, you get sweating on our uh, our dojo floor. <laughs> House of Pain. It's been a while since I've been there. Yeah, you know, and Paul, just, just, to, just to cap this, you know, it's... it's, it's to all the naysayers saying that, you know, well, we didn't prove our, 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 our cause, so to speak. Yes, we did. There was significant difference when people were there with the guns. Yes, unfortunately, for those who expected perfect results, there was not a single instance where both of the bad guys were eliminated. Mind you, I do have some training and background. My partner is a former Marine with combat experience. And we knew that there is a person with the gun. And we knew the building layout and we had some other factors working for us and we were not afraid to die because it was a marker rounds. So, you know, again, at least five or seven times one of us was shot. A couple of times, definitely fight ending shots to the face, neck, chest. Other times there was legs, there were arms that would definitely change our capabilities, affect our capability to continue do what we were doing. Mm -hmm. Difference was very, very significant, you know. Do not expect media to give you that because they won't no matter what we do. Use your own mind, use your own common sense. You know guns would make difference. You don't need to go out there and scream and, 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 and be upset the outcome was not perfect and good guy didn't didn't win with a score, you know, to zero. Uh. Right? That's not reality. Things happen, there's too many variables involved. Have your weapon, carry your weapon train with your weapon instead of spending extra extra money on the newest holes and newest tactical pouches and all that stuff spend more money on training do force on force training not just live fire plinking at the, tar at, the, at the targets go get involved that's how you get better that's how you can make a difference or you could get one of those daggers that you can stick to the bottom of your magazine plate so you that can, way you'll never lose your magazine yeah, it's yeah. stuck in your hand <laughs> There you go. <laughs> All right, Sonny. Uh, we appreciate you taking the time uh, to be with us today. And, uh, folks, we're going to come right back with our good guy of the week. For all you guys that follow us on Facebook, you'll know that I opened up the good guy question to the Facebook followers this week. That's facebook.com slash student of the gun. Or you can just go to Facebook and search student of the gun on there, and it'll come up. Um, I opened up the thing and dad's over there staring at me sideways headed for some reason i don't know really know why but <laughs> you have a doll right there you want to shake it well anyway so you can go to facebook.com slash student of the gun and uh i opened up the question on there last week i believe i did that on friday and i asked i said the the best question posted in the comments below will be chosen for the good guy pack next week and we actually had a lot of good questions there. One of them is going to be a topic for an entire show. So stay tuned for that. But this week's good guy is Jeremy Manley. And congratulations, Jeremy. I need you to send me, that's Jared, J-A-R-R-80, at studentofthegun.com. I need you to send me your, type your name, your mailing address, your phone number, your shirt size, and your email in there for me. Uh, that way I can just copy and paste. It makes my job much easier. And I appreciate it. Anyway, Jeremy says... Why is it so important for your first reaction in a potential life or death situation to be moving from where you are, standing or sitting? That is an excellent question. And the reason that we picked that question is because, number one, I believe that lots of people out in the audience may be, you know, having a question about it or they've seen it. Or How many of you out there have seen, you know, training videos or you watched YouTube videos or whatever where people do that and you're like, all right, deal, dude, what what's the deal? Is that just some kind of weird happy dance that tactical trainers do to make them look more tactical and what have you. And I've actually had uh, people that are supposed to be firearms instructors, or at least they have a certificate on their wall, 
who don't understand that. And they're like, why are you moving all around? Your, your target is there. Take care of shooting your target first, blah, 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 blah. Okay. Well, number one, unless you are going out with a gun already in your hand and you have the plan to engage human beings with your firearm, if that's your plan, then you don't need to move, worry about it because you are the initiator. You're initiating the action. If you're Joe Average you know, citizen, if you're just a dude, or even if you're not a dude, even if you're a cop and you're just going about your daily day business and you're writing tickets or you're getting coffee or whatever you're doing, and you are aggressed. Someone aggresses you. Someone attacks you. Someone initiates. They are the aggressor. They start it. You are in a position where you have to react. And that person knows when they start the attack they they see you they made the decision i'm going to you know initiate my attack and it it may not be you know all that a lot of times people that are predators they just get that sense that oh this person would be a good victim and go well you weren't expecting it if you were expecting it you wouldn't be there so what happens you've got a bad guy an initiator who has started the action you as the good guy have to react to that action And part of that reaction should be you moving from wherever it is that the bad guy found you. You're like, well, what's that all about? Big deal here. I mean, so I take one step to the left or one step to the right or or I get up and I move or whatever. Big deal. He still has eyes and he can see me. Yes, I understand that. But he saw you and he planned to attack you on what we call the X. He knows where the X is and that's where he's going to attack you is on the X. And you move off of the X. You move and he doesn't know which way you're going to move. You know, he has no idea because you are acting on your own. What he's going to have to do, he, she, they, it, they're going to have to change their plan ever so slightly and redirect their attention to the left, to the right, to whatever. And what that does is that gives you an opportunity because really what you're doing is you're playing catch up with them. There's this thing called the OODA loop. It's observe, orient, decide, and act. Uh, or it's also called Boyd's Loop. And we get into that in great detail in training classes and so forth. But when you are on the receiving end, when you're on the defensive, you have to do, if you hope to survive, you have to survive, you can survive by violence of action. And I'm serious, violence of action. You can't halfway yourself out of an attack. And you have to do something that the bad guy is not expecting because when you do something that the bad guy is not expecting, then he has to take a half a second, a quarter second, a full second, what have you, and reevaluate his attack, re-aim his attack, whatever he happens to be doing. If we're talking about a firearm, if he thinks, okay, I'm going to shoot you right there where you're standing and you move four feet to the left, then he has to redirect. And you say, well, big deal. It only takes him a half second to do that. Life and death scenarios are measured in fractions of seconds. Whoever is ahead in the fractions of seconds generally tends to be the winner. So it's always a good idea to do something that the bad person is not expecting. And that gives you that margin to kind of get ahead. Uh, Because let's face it, you know, you're you're walking to your car uh, from the movies, from the restaurant, from the grocery store, from work, from whatever. And someone has decided that they're going to wait. They're going to lay in wait in the parking lot, and they're going to attack the next person that walks to their car. They've already decided they're going to do that. That is their plan. And they're going to wait until you get to X spot, and then they're going to come up to you and they're like, hey, buddy, what time is it? And as soon as you look at your wrist or whatever, they're going to pounce on you. Bam. As soon as you're not expecting that, you're expecting, I'm going to get to my car, I got to get home, I got 45 minutes to do traffic before wife has dinner on the table. Uh, If you have a normal family, otherwise, uh, you know, maybe you're a wife and you're like, I got to get home because my husband's going to have dinner on the table, whatever. The fact of the matter is, is you're not planning on being attacked. And if you hope to survive that attack, they've already figured out their ambush. You have to do something that they don't expect. And that is the whole reason that we teach people to move, shift, get off the line of sight, whatever. Do something unexpected to buy yourself a half a second, a full second, whatever. So it's always a good idea to do that. You don't want to, the worst thing you can do is you just freeze and stand there because that's what they're expecting you to do and that's what they're hoping you're going to do is just freeze in place and allow them to pummel you, stab you, shoot you, whatever it is that they feel like doing. 
So uh, moving is always a good idea. And you say, well, all right, it's a good idea, but should I do it when I'm training? Should I do it when I'm practicing? Yes. Because if you can't do it on a, in the static environment or the, the safe environment of a practice range, how do you expect to do it in the adrenaline dump, the panic of, oh, my gosh, I was going to walk to my car and now I'm being attacked? You, as, uh, you've probably got the emails that I sent recently. Um, I only sent it to some of you, the more active ones. So if you're not an active subscriber, you probably didn't get the email. But what did we say? We said that you default to the level of training that you master. And how do you master something? It's something you have to do it like 10,000 times or something like that. Yeah, I mean, like depending that. on which martial art instructor you talk to, yeah. number of punches, number of kicks, number of whatever. But, yeah, you have to actually do it before you need it. Yeah. People think, oh, well, if it, if the time ever comes, I'll know what to do. No, you won't. You're going to panic or you're going to freeze. Right. Or you're just going to stand there trying to figure it out, and then you're going to be on the ground looking up. And also another thing, going back to what Dad said about the, the attacker being ready – your attacker has had hours, days, maybe weeks to plan his attack on you. You are stuck. You are left with seconds to decide what you're going to do to save your life. Yeah. Do you have what it takes to make that decision, the split-second decision that you need to make? That's the question that I have for you. Do you? Do you have the confidence it takes? Do you have the knowledge? I don't know. I can't answer that question for you, but you can. All right. Well, that brings us right up to the end of the show. We want to thank Sonny Pazikas for joining us today. We really appreciate it. Uh, we got really deep into the weeds with force on force and scenario training and so forth. But that's something that you guys need to know about. Uh, folks, we're going to be back tomorrow. It's just the beginning of the week, and we got a whole week ahead of us. So thanks for joining us. Thank you to SWAT Fuel, SWATFuel.com. Velocity Triggers, if you've got a black rifle, Velocity Triggers has something for you. And Brownells at Brownells.com. Check those guys out. If you own a gun, Brownells has something for you. All right, folks, don't forget, what are you? You're a beginner once, but you should indeed be a student for life. <laughs>